Well, so far we've, uh, at least for me, unveiled the mysteries of uh, Bigelow Aerospace, and we've seen kind of the, the grand view. We've uh, next heard about one of the key drivers in space tourism, which is the financial um, rewards or the financial um, opportunities, as well as the reality of let's go do something. Um, the next presentation is kind of the how do we all get there beginning um, discussions. And our first how do we get there discussion is going to come from Chuck Lauer, who is a co-founder and VP business development for Pioneer Rocket Plane. Um, he's also, when I first met him, was uh, president of Peregrine Properties Still am. and uh, has served, uh, fortunately, uh, NASA and uh, some of the agencies in the government are willing to listen to, to guys that are actually doing things and has served in an advisory capacity um, on a commercial space transportation study. So uh, we're a little ahead of schedule, and I hope that means that uh, Chuck will take his time, give us the presentation that he wants to give it, and once again, we're going to leave uh, enough time for, for some questions at the end. Um, Chuck, welcome. Thank you. Um, so say so yeah, I'm uh, one of the founders of the company, along with Mitch Clapp and Bob Zubrin, and uh, been working this gig for over four years now. And I got to tell you, it's tough. Uh, this is by far and away the hardest thing that I have ever done in my life, and I'm nowhere near done yet. Um, you cannot really overstate the difficulties of being a startup company where the minimum cost of capital to enter is measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars. It is, and you have uh, a market that's not particularly conducive to uh, uh, new entries and an incredible legal and regulatory burden to go along with it. This is a real pitch, folks, and the more help that we get politically from the advocacy community, the more it helps all of us. And, uh, you know, potentially we could actually see three or four of the startup RLB companies actually make it to market with the product. Um, you know, we, our, our cut is at um, you know, two, probably three, probably not more than four. And uh, uh, in, in part because of the crowding out effect on the financing, which is why um, some of the political issues, particularly regarding things like the Bro Bill, are extremely important. You start introducing uh, additional uh, discontinuities into an already difficult situation with um, uh, things like the Bro Bill, and effectively the capital dries up uh, for the rest of the people that are trying to do something. So th this is a big issue, uh, at least for me. <laughs> And uh, we have to uh, really watch it over the next uh, three to six months, maybe carrying over into the second session of this Congress. I think the conventional wisdom right now is that Bro uh, uh, probably won't get through this year, but is likely to have something happen before uh, the end of this Congress and, and the end of the 2000 time frame. Anyway, so much for my political plugging. Uh, Pioneer, uh, basic design philosophy is a high-performance military airplane. You look at the similarities of what is involved. Uh, we are a crew, crew, a piloted vehicle, not a crew vehicle, um, and uh, we it's uh, two seats side by side. The uh, uh, the X Prize third seat is the jump seat in the middle, like you see on a conventional uh, uh, civilian transport. Um, it takes off horizontally, like God meant airplanes to do, um, and. Uh, Sorry, uh, and uh, uh, so it's a conventional runway takeoff and landing. Any any good old ten thousand foot runway that uh, can accommodate uh, a DC-10 or 747 is just fine for us. The uh, the rocket plane uh, uh, actually takes you know wheels are up in about four thousand feet. So potentially your your average commuter airport could uh, one day uh, house uh, pathfinders. Um, and uh, the key feature here is uh, aerial propellant transfer. Work a day in the military world happens something like 400 times a day every, well, during normal periods of time, it happens 400 times a day. It's probably several times that now with all of the uh, 
operations that are going on in uh, Kosovo and in Iraq, in addition to the uh, regular training and readiness stuff. But this, this is a known thing. It is a fundamentally, fundamental enabling technology of military aviation. And what we're doing is applying the um, aerial propellant transfer techniques. Uh, the principal difference is that we're using a cryogenic fluid rather than kerosene. We, we do also uh, transfer kerosene in the, in the usual way. Um, but uh, this is a quick turnaround vehicle. Uh, military aircraft typically, uh, when they have to, will sortie several times a day. Uh, it'd be really nice if there was enough business out there that we could fly this thing several times a day. Um, as it is right now, when we strictly look at the CompSat business, you know, maybe we fly a couple of times a month. And that's a real shame because, you know, you're, you're building a very uh, uh, capable vehicle that most of the time is just sitting in the hangar. That is a huge waste of an asset. And uh, the only way that you fully utilize the non-recurring investment in a system like this is to build new markets. Um, I've got multiple slides on all the technical stuff that I'm, I'm really not going to talk about too much. Uh, part they're all you know proprietary stuff, so I'd have to swear you all to secrecy. But uh, the uh, the idea that um, this is a low risk um, approach to building um, a, a, a piloted space vehicle. It is a suborbital vehicle uh, for the same reason. It is less technically challenging, particularly when you're using LOX kerosene propellants like we are, to build a Mach 12, 70 nautical mile Alan Shepard type vehicle than it is to build uh, a LOX kerosene single station orbit like Rotary's trying to do. Uh, and, or uh, you notice that essentially all of the startups are using LOX kerosene with the, uh, the space access being the exception. Um, there's a real reason for that. It is a really, really efficient fuel mix, and the virtues of dense propellants. Oh, <laughs> uh, I had it on fiber. Excuse me. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> 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 I got time. It's for you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> The, uh, uh, the virtues of dense propellants are something that Mitch Klapkin uh, wax poetic on for an extended period of time, but uh, the point is that virtually all of us have chosen the same propellant mix, and there are very good technical reasons for it. Uh, the exceptions to our system um, are the fact that uh, we uh, take essentially a large fighter plane and uh, put a big rocket engine on the back of it. All of our propulsion exists. The air breathing engine is the uh, GE F404-RM12. For those of you uh, familiar with the subtleties, it's the Gripen engine. Um, and uh, it's the engine uh, off the F-18. Uh, it exists. You can buy it. You can call it GE. And they will quote you a price. And they will deliver it to you, uh, you know, as soon as you want it. The, uh, the main propulsion on the rocket side is the Russian RD-120, uh, which we are uh, fortunately procuring from a U.S. supplier uh, named Pratt Whitney. They've already made the, the deal and all of the uh, TAAs and the other uh, incredibly burdensome nonsense that the State Department is uh, throwing at all of us now. So we have a U.S. company that we can buy our engine from. This also has the virtue of existing. Uh, cargo rails uh, where you latch them in. So we roll in six of these uh, standard uh, 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 Department of Transportation certified, uh, which is important for the regulatory regime. The DOT is the parent company of the FAA. And the fact that the LOX tanks are already certified for a much more hazardous environment, namely, you know, I-45, um, yeah, they're, they're going to have considerably less risk um, of an accident or a leak uh, in, in comfortably in the belly of an airplane than they uh, will rolling up and down the e-ways. Uh, so we're using, again, it's the existing components, and fortunately the, this class of uh, freighter has enough lift that we don't have to go to uh, uh, heroic materials for uh, the tankage um, inside, the, uh, inside the, uh, the tank or aircraft. Um, cost, performance, we are, uh, you know, in, in the range of uh, 7 million bucks for 5,000 uh, pounds. You know, obviously those of you that know pricing know that's a very competitive price in the current market. It is, 
you know, right in the ballpark with Rotary and, uh, in terms of what they're quoting and considerably less than uh, any of our competitors um, and, uh, with the uh, caveat being that of the uh, RLV startups, we are um, the smallest uh, uh, in terms of total throw weight. We, uh, uh, we can get up to about 5,000 pounds and uh, that's about it. Uh, it's a function of uh, how much uh, the, 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 the amount of propellant you can actually transfer and uh, the characteristics of the upper stage because we're a suborbital vehicle, we're using an expendable upper stage and we have a finite amount of payload bay uh, to, to partition off between the uh, upper stage and the uh, net payload area. Um, so we are, uh, we're, we're the small guy in the block. Um, this, is, uh, this is how the typical mission works. This would be for a polar uh, launch and uh, what we do is we, uh, we take off at Vandenberg Air Force Base, uh, we fly up the coast, the green line is uh, the uh, good old subsonic Mach 0.8 type uh, trundle up the coast. Uh, we rendezvous with the tanker uh, just off the uh, 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 coast of Seattle and uh, start the uh, LOX tanking at here. There's about, if you're going to put a timeline on this too, uh, we've got about 15 minutes between here and here. At this point, you, uh, uh, you uh, punch up the rocket engine, you uh, ascend um, at a fairly steep uh, uh, angle of attack coming up. You then, uh, from Miko, you are then coasting over the top of the hump and uh, you release the uh, upper stage uh, along with the uh, payload uh, right at the top of the parabola. Uh, the upper stage motor fires and it uh, continues on uh, doing its thing. The rocket plane re-enters, um, and uh, uh, once we uh, uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, high G maneuvers in here, we, we reach a peak of about five Gs um, axially uh, during ascent. So from uh, from the, the cruise standpoint, you're getting your G loads both ways. You take it through your belly on the way up. When you come back in, we're, we're entering at about a 40 degree uh, angle of attack, so you're taking your G-loads through your butt like you typically do in a military fighter on the way down, but you take them through here on the way up. Uh, and then you have, uh, depending on the uh, uh, trajectory you're flying, for the satellite launch you get about five minutes of microgravity at the top of the parabola. Uh, for other missions, we uh, modify this and, and we can actually stretch the uh, period of micro G out significantly for, uh, for other applications, which I'll get into in a minute. But uh, uh, you know, this here is important. The FAA is really, really squirrely about overland uh, launch corridors. Um, and uh, the people that are, uh, which is the principal reason that Kistler's in Australia now, um, they have yet to really um, uh, get comfortable with that. You've got uh, X-33, doing an overland footprint. There is an environmental impact statement and all that. That's a government uh, issue. Uh, um, potentially, uh, those corridors as established, being paid for by the government, you can make an argument that those launch corridors become public domain and uh, anybody else can travel the same footprint. Uh, nobody's actually said that yet. I, I, I'm asserting it. And uh, it gets to the point <laughs> that um, that we want to uh, look at overland routes. Uh, certainly, for uh, for some of the growth markets, uh, we have to. But uh, the, the the mantra of the low risk technical approach, we can do everything we need to do strictly over water. And for a uh, a station type orbit, we would do essentially the same thing off the east coast. We would fly. Uh, north out of Kennedy and recover at um, uh, closed down military airfield somewhere in the Boston area. Uh, so it's the, uh, uh, this particular circle route has uh, an extra couple hours of flying in it in order to take off and land at Vandenberg um, uh, for the west coast and the, and the high inclination orbits. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily have to do that. Um, and uh, for uh, station orbits, we would, uh, we would not do that. But uh, point here is that you, know, you don't do anything beyond your um, flight. You, you can do a certain amount of flight testing uh, under experimental. If you look at the uh, rotary ATV, it does have the N something something experimental uh, on it. Um, and uh, that's okay until you get to the point when you light your main rocket engine. According to the FAA guys, 
the way they interpret the existing regs, uh, the minute you start rocket propulsion, you need a launch license. They are now developing uh, rules regarding the testing and certification process for this, but uh, the fact that we can do everything over water makes them a lot more comfortable. Uh, the fact that we also are a piloted vehicle does make them more comfortable. Gary is absolutely right in that regard. Uh, in our case, the, uh, the pilots are actually doing useful things. They are not sacrificial lambs to the FAA. They are, in fact, flying the rocket plane. They are essential. You could not do this uh, with the robot vehicle. The flying refueling, that you, with, even with you know, a short radio link, you, there is so much training and so much going on between here, here, and here while you're doing that, that you simply cannot design a system to do that robotically. Uh, particularly when you're, when you're taking on as much weight as we are. Uh, there's talk, uh, you, you see things in Ab Week where they're talking about having Global Hawk uh, be able to re re refuel and things like that. Uh, it has yet to be demonstrated. And that's not a demonstration that we care to make. Our pilots are there for a reason. You need them to make the mission work. You need them to fly the plane. It's that simple. This is uh, no, another, another good reason to be flying up and down the West Coast. The Air Force has a considerable investment in uh, West Coast range infrastructure. Part of the um, uh, previous legislation for commercial space is uh, the Western Commercial Space Center has access to this. The way the Air Force interprets the uh, Commercial Space Launch Act, um, these things are viewed as uh, effectively surplus property for commercial space launch missions, we pay the incremental cost for our period of use, which is a hugely favorable deal. You know, where it's the you know those uh, staff sergeants on the radar, we pay they they book an hour for us, we pay them at their at their direct pay rate. It is uh, it is a very very attractive thing to have, and uh, you know for polar missions, we can't beat it. So. Um, the, I guess I have to say the, the official disclaimer here. Uh, we, we are a satellite launch company, first, second, third, and fourth order. Uh, this is, uh, I, I'm a lot more um, out there than any of my partners are in terms of talking about new markets. We make our business case strictly on satellite launch. That is, when you, if you, those of you that are, uh, either accredited investors or industry partners that would actually have use for our uh, uh, business plan would see that in there. All of our projections are strictly based on CompSats. Um, the, a year ago, the, uh, the FAA was uh, you know, predicting very rosy things. Um, it would be real interesting to see what happens in the FAA market this year with the troubles that Iridium is having with uh, the continuing uh, difficulties in terms of Teledisic getting their uh, act together with their strategic partners. You know, we all see this in the press. Um, it, it may be that last year's FAA forecast was the peak in terms of how many total Leo payloads that are out there. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, there aren't that many. It's, if you look at the curves, and under peak times, you get a couple hundred payloads a year that are in the, you know, 2,000 kilogram class or less. Um, and uh, it's a real, real spiky market. You get, when, when you get your big deployment surges, you get 200, 200 plus under the optimistic scenario, a little less under the, under the baseline scenario. And then the next year, it drops off to sub 100. It, and uh, you know, we're, we're not going to assume that we need 100% market share like Steve Wurst does in order to uh, uh, make his business case close. We can, we can make our business case close with somewhere around a 20 or 25% market share. And uh, so you're looking at 25, 50 payloads a year. If you get a surge in the deployment side, you get a big constellation going up. At that point, you're competing with the heavy lift launchers too. Now we, we can, uh, uh, on a per satellite basis, uh, beat a Delta hands down on an Iridium class. So we, we, we can undercut the per bird cost on a Delta by about a factor of two. When you look at the replenishment markets, uh, which are primarily Long March right now, and you know there's, there's lots of other benefits to beating Long March, uh, um, 
but the uh, we're we're way less on a per bird basis than a long march and any of the small western launchers. It's you know quarter the price, but there just isn't that much business out there. And um, while we can make a business case close on 25 launches a year, it really sucks to have to have all that rest of the capacity just sitting there in the hangar being unused. So new markets. Commercial station logistics. The, uh, the mission that's up right now, we have astronauts up there in construction, and they are bringing two tons of materials up to the station for 450 frickin' million dollars, people. When you look at the, um, uh, you, you look at the mass delivered uh, to the Mir missions, you, uh, you look at um, uh, station logistics using the space Hub double module, the total amount the shuttle actually brings up in terms of useful payload under the best of circumstances is well less than 10,000 pounds. And uh, that is a huge price per pound for mass delivery. Now there's this parallel universe of station logistics whereby all the launchers are free. Station program doesn't count shuttle cost. The Ariane 5, the H2, the protons. These are all government contributions. Nobody has to write a check. And, you know, funny thing, folks, it is really, really hard to compete with free. And uh, uh, this is an area that, from a policy standpoint, I think needs to be turned around. Um, the, uh, the ability for vehicles like ours, like Kelly's or Rotary's or Kistler's or anybody else's, to service this market at a small fraction of the real cost to the U.S. taxpayer, or, you know, for that matter, you could talk to the European Space Agency, and uh, I mean, they, they can sell as many A5s as they can make. Um, you know, say, hey, why don't you, uh, uh, an ATV takes up about, uh, I think about 12,000 pounds. You know, you go, go to the Europeans and make a barter deal and say, you know, go, go sell your A5 to uh, Hughes and let us uh, launch three Pathfinders to give you the equivalent up mass. Uh, Unlikely, but at least worth talking about. Um, and the same thing with the Japanese and the H2. The, the, the vehicles, the cheapest vehicle is the uh, Progress. And uh, funny thing, everybody's really worried about the Russians living up to their uh, end of the deal for uh, the six or seven Progress flights they need. Uh, essentially, two, two Pathfinder launches equals one Progress. And uh, we have the ability, uh, this was a study we did, and we were actually a, a subcontractor on one of the staff's efforts uh, um, that went in. Uh, this was a conceptual design that we came up with for a, a commercial pressurized logistics carrier. We're using the same common berthing mechanism that the uh, MPLM does. Principal difference is that the uh, diameter is not 14 and a half foot, it's south of 10 feet. So we can't carry up the full four rack complement. But when you really look at the cargo mass of station uh, going up into station for pressurized, a lot of it is these uh, soft pack foot lockers uh, and a lot of things that are in express racks come up in lockers and drawers. There are certain things where the racks have to come up. Uh, if you have a completely integrated experiment that's coming up in a rack, we can carry two racks up. Uh, it, actually, we don't have enough room to put them side by side, so what you do is you have one rack up in here, which comes about over to here, another one down in here, and then you, uh, th th then you uh, uh, center your CGs by packing the rest of your stuff around in there so that you can maintain uh, good uh, flying characteristics uh, coming up. Uh, really? Yeah? Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, uh, one of the things that uh, we think would be extremely useful is to have uh, sort of the modern equivalent of the 2001 pod um, to be able to do that last mile approach. Uh, the, the principal difficulty is not getting a couple of tons to 200 miles, 50 degrees. It's getting inside the approach ellipsoid in the uh, uh, terminal control zone of the space station. And that involves a lot of expensive hardware and redundancy and everything else. We would like to keep the same commercial upper stage that we're using for our ComSat launches, uh, bolt an aluminum can to it, throw, throw the material up there, and then have a, uh, uh, another vehicle come and, and take care of the last mile problem for us. Uh, it could be a, a souped up version of one of these cans. It could be something else. Uh, and I'd really like to see that. It's not anything we want to do, but uh, we would like to cooperate with somebody else on that. Okay. Through these real quick. Uh, one of the things sure we can do. 
I'm sorry? Could you make sure all of those go as high up as possible? Sure. Thanks. The, uh, uh, one of the things that we can do in terms of uh, uh, growing the market is uh, fly things that we don't release. And we can do this really cheaply because the biggest cost that we have uh, in terms of our recurring cost is the cost of the upper stage. So for uh, microgravity flights, we can we actually stretch out the trajectory and we can do about 10 minutes of continuous pretty high quality microgravity on a long lofting parabolic trajectory and we could carry uh, a rack of gas cans for student type experiments, we could carry up uh, uh, the uh, battery boxes is another uh, sort of a, of a cargo envelope on a central truss. This would be similar to a, like a shuttle a cross bay cargo carrier. And we could even get into having a, uh, a hard top version of the rocket plane rather than a T top version of the rocket plane where we have a pressurized fuselage and we're able to carry up um, uh, station racks and do flight qualification. You know, one of the things, these, these racks, that the scientist that's stuffing that rack has been working on his project for years. It's, you know, his career in a lot of cases are bet on how that rack's going to work on station. You put it all together, it'd be really nice to do an equivalent of a burn-in where you take the thing through launch and vibration loads, then you get the microgravity, then you get the landing loads, you take it back out and you see, you know, you, you see what the results are. Uh, and we can do this for a you know, payload. You know, fifty hundred thousand dollars per payload. You know, you would think that there would be some interest in that. Hell yeah. <laughs> now, if we're already we're already doing that, and we're flying suborbital trajectories, there's no reason not to look at other markets. It turns out, for uh, one of one of the things when you're looking at the fast cargo market is how do you handle unless you have city pairs going all over the world, the hub and spoke system works in this market too. It turns out the best global hub is in Anchorage. You can, and so you can take all your Pacific Rim countries, all your North American countries, you hub out of Anchorage, and you set this up on, on time zone pairs, you know, evening in New York, morning in Tokyo, afternoon in Europe. There are windows where you can do global same-day delivery, or in the case of uh, you know, Japan to uh, U.S. yesterday delivery, and, uh, and, and be able to, uh, to make it go. Now, the, what, this also requires overland flight corridors and overland supersonic flight, and so there is a huge regulatory issue attached to this. But it's a big market. Right now, the FedEx world is a neighborhood of $40 billion a year, which is, uh, what, 20 times the launch industry? So it's easier to capture a small share of a bigger market than it is to capture uh, a uh, big share of a small market. Now, if we're already doing that, there's no conceptual reason why you can't uh, take your uh, your hardtop version of the rocket plane and put seats in it, and actually have um, Mach 12 passenger transport. Huge regulatory issue again, but there's nothing fundamentally wrong in the technology that would prohibit you from doing this, and it works in the same manner that. Uh, uh, the rest of the airplane world does. The aircraft engines are stage three noise compliant. You have powered landings at conventional airports. This works with the trillions of dollars that are invested in airport infrastructure all around the world. This works. But you can't do it right now. So, as long as you're talking about fast package delivery, there are other missions as well that uh, uh, can also work. And having the uh, ability to deliver uh, a couple of uh, precision guided munitions uh, wherever you need to in a matter of uh, an hour or less uh, you know may have some interest to the military you you look at this little map down here this this is throwing stuff out of out of anchorage and basically you can hit all of your uh, relevant targets of interest uh, with the same bomb load as an f-117 does this is essentially what the b2 does right now it's, it takes some 10 or 12 hours to get there another 10 or 12 hours to get back um, we can do it a lot faster. Uh, compared to what a cruise missile does, these little yellow arrows in here are your typical delivery pass of a cruise missile. And uh, uh, when you have the Navy fleets that are needed to shoot the cruise missiles, the cost per pound of payload delivered potentially could be very attractive. Uh, a lot of talk about Virgin here. Uh, I, uh, you know, everybody swear you didn't see this, but uh, uh, the. Uh, um, you know, Vir Virgin is shopping around. It's been all over the net. Um, everybody knows he's talking to Gary. Um, this is a discretionary consumer market, and having the ability to, uh, uh, you know, put your name on the tail, you know, it, performance is one thing. All of the safety and everything else is another thing. But 
looks are also important. And if uh, Branson's looking at where he's going to put his red tail on, is he going to put, put it on a traffic cone or a sexy jet? <laughs> Anybody from Rotary here? Okay. Uh, finally, Charlie, you're going to like this. Uh, there are other new consumer markets that you can do. If you are, <laughs> please, please, that, you know, no press on this one. But uh, if, if you are doing all the things that I was just talking about in the stack, and if you are particularly things like you know military delivery systems, doing this is comparatively speaking a piece of cake. And if some rich Japanese billionaire wants to go out exactly like this, we are completely capable of making this happen. And uh, the guy over there might be interested in marketing these services. But uh, this, this is a slide I put up that lets the FAA guys go screaming from the room. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the implications of doing this are, are, are manifold. And, uh, but potentially, you know, if, if it was the, the full coffin, not the, the lipstick case, and somebody really wanted to do this and wanted to get the sunset just like this while his family is right there, we could base in Hawaii, get the call and say, OK, go, and you go out and blaze a glory. I, you know, if I have to go, this is the way I want to go. So anyway, thank you, folks. I uh, appreciate it. Questions? Yes, sir. Chuck, all this is really incredible, and, and it's great. What the $64 question is, what is keeping the investment community from being more attractive to ventures of this nature? We're not an internet stock. Uh, <laughs> Space companies are god awful, glacially slow to make any kind of a decision. And we really need to have our strategic partners in place before we can make a credible case to the investment bankers. And you know, so we're, we've been circling in the Boeing holding pattern for six months now. And uh, hopefully that'll change. But uh, it, it's, it's tough. Do you see any any not any movement in the future on the defense side to uh, help in the funding? No. <laughs> uh, when we have a plane sitting on a tarmac in Vandenberg, we can call it Mike Ryan or our, I wouldn't do it. Our, our four-star general Tony McPeak would do it. Say, you know, hey Mike, you want to go for a check ride? You know, that's pretty much all you need to do. But uh, uh, in, in advance of that, um, no. It's, it's not the way the Air Force does business, unfortunately. Yes, ma'am. On your uh, pattern where you're taking off from Vandenberg, flying up to Seattle to refuel, when you've uh, refueled in the air and you're twice your weight, if you decide not to ignite and go to low Earth orbit, can you land with all that fuel? Or no, you jettison the locks. That, you, you, no, no way. Uh, that's, uh, you, you would, uh, one of the abort systems is doing a rapid jettison of the locks. If you don't get a light on the rocket engine, you lighten up the plane and you come back and uh, 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 figure out what went wrong and try it again. Yeah. yeah. Just looking at some of the designs, I get a feeling that uh, your center of gravity, yeah, keeping that steady is a very interesting problem. Yeah, that's the, if uh, the, there, you, you may have picked it up in the, in, in the, the three view, uh, we split the locks tanks for exactly that reason. The previous designs had all the locks behind the payload bay. It simply didn't work. You couldn't maintain CG within the flying envelope unless you have about a third of the locks mass forward, two thirds of the locks mass back, and you, you manage your, uh, your relative fills in order to keep your, your flying envelope right. What are the regulatory hurdles for refueling locks? Uh, we would be doing this through what's called a supplemental type certification on the tanker. Uh, it turns out the, the KC-10 is the only military plane that started its life as in the civilian world and has an STC. Uh, for uh, for its mods, uh, what we do is an additional set of mods uh, with approvals under the supplemental type certification regs for the tanker. The rocket plane side is inherent in the launch license because it's, it's one of the fundamental technologies we need to make the system work. Uh, once you get FAA certification, is that good for anywhere else in the world? Mm, informally, yeah. I mean, the, the U.S. certification is effectively reciprocal. In, in this case, uh, on launch licensing, it's hard to say because a lot of countries simply don't have the type of launch licensing regimes. I, I'm sure Australia would uh, probably accept it. Um, 
in terms of flying out of Europe or something like that. I'm, uh, I'm less sure, but uh, uh, we'll have to see. Last one. One more, yeah. Is that, uh, what were, if you're fly, doing your, your two hour deliveries, commercial that you were talking about, you've got to get your plane back, right? You have, uh, you have tankers on both sides. You would, uh, um, what you would, what you would want to do is have, you know, a sort of like four hour turnaround where you're, you're, you're matching up these morning, evening, city pair, time zone pairs. You have tankers on both sides of the respective oceans. And uh, um, so in order to do that sort of thing, it is a considerable capital investment. You're talking about a minimum of 20, 25 planes and half dozen tankers to make that sort of a business case. So it's not anything you can really do incrementally. You might have like an LA to Tokyo, a couple of city pairs, New York to London, that you could start out with, but it's not anything we want to do. We would have to team with uh, a FedEx or a DHL or somebody like that and uh, could be contracting to fly the planes for them, but it's not anything that we have the capability of doing on our own. But you would need the licenses and those other things. Oh yeah, you need, at that point, you yeah. need a different class. In the U.S., uh, you need to be certified as a, uh, as a cargo plane. That's a different license from a passenger plane because you don't have paying customers at risk. Everybody in the plane is, is, a, is an employee of the company, but it is, it, it is an airplane certification very much in the airplane side of the FAA, not the space side of the FAA. And it's, you know, it, it is a considerable investment. Thanks very much, John.